Once again, I want to welcome you to Church Online today on this very special Palm Sunday weekend, this day that, that really marks the beginning of what is commonly referred to as the Passion Week, uh, where Jesus would begin this journey that would lead him to a cross and a grave only for three days later in the ultimate death-defying event would rise again. Come on, somebody, would rise again. As today, uh, we're kicking off our Easter series, Death Defying, uh, with a message that I've entitled, How to Face Death and Live to Tell About It. How to Face Death and Live to Tell About It. And I do need to pre-warn you a little bit uh, that where we're going with things today may feel a little heavy. <laughs> it may feel a little heavy, especially for a, a palm Sunday weekend message, because uh, let's be real, I think for a lot of us, when we think of a Palm Sunday a weekend message, like, like we, uh, we think of uh, sort of a party, right? Like, like isn't that what the, the Palm Sunday account was? Was, you know, Jesus is, is riding into Jerusalem on this donkey. The people are lining the streets, uh, trying to get a glimpse of him, when all of a sudden uh, it breaks out in what is, is almost kind of reminiscent of like a Broadway musical. Right, like suddenly uh, you hear this chorus, oh, what a beautiful morning, right? And, and other people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And, and again, it's a scene that, that felt like a party, it felt like a celebration. But, but here's the thing. While it might not be the first thing that comes to our mind when we think of Palm Sunday, can I tell you what we're talking about today? Definitely would have been on the forefront of Jesus' mind. And it's this reality of death. It's this reality of death, a reality that, let's be honest, we don't like to think about, let alone talk about it, right? I'm like pretty sure, like, or for a lot of you, when you get done watching this message, like the, the first thing uh, that, that you're going to think of doing, if given the choice between hanging out, watching more Sports Center, or you know, checking out the latest Hallmark movie on the Hallmark Channel, you know, if given the option, I, I doubt you're going to be like, you know what? I think what I'd rather do is let's take a family, kids, hop in the car. Let's take a family road trip to the mortuary. <laughs> like you're probably not going to do that. Or, you know, I think, you know what would be fun? Let's work through the will. Like, no, no, no one does that because it, it seems kind of depressing. It seems kind of a morbid. Um, it, but look, not just that. I, I think the reason a lot of us don't like to spend much time thinking or, or really talking about death is because, is because for a lot of us, we we naturally think, well, what's the use, right? Like, what's the use? Like, I can't do anything from, you know, to stop death from happening. And, and listen, that's very true. That is, as I got to tell you, I've been doing some research around this topic as 
I like to think of myself not just as a pastor, but as sort of a, a wannabe academic as well. And so I've, I've looked into the Harvard reviews, looked into uh, some of the Oxford reviews, the Yale reviews, to try to find some of the latest statistics around death. And, uh, and, and here's what I found. This, this might just blow some of your minds. These are the, the, the latest, up-to-date, up-to-this-week stats around death. You, you ready for this? You ready for this? Check this out. I, I, I know, crazy, right? Like 100% of us will die someday. 100% of us will die someday. Now, understandable if maybe that stat didn't really come as much of a surprise to you. Because truth is, there's a few things more universal than death. Can, can we all agree? <laughs> right? Like sometimes I'll preach series like on relationships or, or finances or, or serving, recognizing that it might not always you know, apply to everybody in the room or everyone that's watching this. But, but when it comes to death, it's safe to say this is a subject that applies to every one of us. Like if you're rich, you're going to die. If you're poor, you're going to die. Uh, if you don't exercise and diet, can I tell you, you're going to die. And even if you do exercise and diet, can I tell you, eventually, you're still going to die. Maybe not quite as soon as those who never exercise, but it happens to all of us. Like at the end of the day, all of us will have to face death. Aren't you glad you tuned in to church today? <laughs> Come on, Safadi. But, but in saying all that, listen, hopefully this, this encourages you, and hopefully it kind of starts to turn a little bit of a corner here, is that while you can't stop death from happening, that doesn't mean you have to let death stop you from living. Uh, look, if the Easter message, I think, reminds us of anything, is that while you can't stop death, from happening, that doesn't mean you have to let death stop you from living. In fact, this might explain why Paul, in describing what's, what Christ's victory over death means for us, explains it the way he does. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, he says, when this body that decays is changed into a body that cannot decay, and this mortal body is changed into a body that will live forever, uh, death is turned into victory. So, so death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? I love that because as important as what's being said here is the tone in which it's being said. The tone in which it's being said, a tone that, that might best be described as one of defiance. One of defiance is to defy something literally means to openly challenge the authority or power of someone or something. To not conform to or follow the pattern set before you. In other words, Paul, in talking about how to face death and, and really live to tell about it, doesn't deny its reality. He just refuses to accept its authority, its hold, its, its grip, its control and influence over so many of our lives through fear. Through fear. You know, for us and I, some of our favorite shows on TV to really sort of binge watch are, are these survival shows. As lately, we've really been into one uh, on National Geographic, and it's a, a show called Something Bit Me. And it's these different survival accounts of, of people, you know, kind of heroically surviving these, these kind of random animal attacks, if you will. Um, but probably our favorite survival show of all time to really binge watch is a show called The Kings of Pain. The Kings of Pain. Now, if you don't get Discovery Channel or uh, have never heard of this show, just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what it's about, it's basically uh, about two guys who allow themselves to be bitten and stung by a variety of things in order to measure pain levels and risk to life. And in fact, actually, I thought it'd be fun to, to, to share with you a short clip uh, from one of the episodes of this show to kind of help you get a little bit of an idea of Kind of really what I'm talking about here. Take a look. That's a horrible sight. Yeah, my nervousness has just gone to terror. All right, guys, I'm going in. Oh, yeah, there they go. There they go. There they go. That's a horrible sight. Yeah. 
already feel them like crawling on me and they haven't even touched me yet. Yeah, dude, my heart is like... These ants defend their colonies vigorously with a ferocious combination. First, the mandibles attach, delivering a very painful bite. Then they sting repeatedly, injecting a dose of venom. The venom contains an alkaloid. Now, this alkaloid sends out a pheromone that alerts the other ants to attack. It can result in residual swelling and pain that can last for days. In some cases, that potent venom can cause an allergic reaction, which can be fatal. I'm just going to leave my hand in there until I can't take it anymore. I don't know if that's going to be two seconds or two minutes. I really have no idea. All right, guys, going in. Damn it. Oh, yeah, there they go. There they go. There they go. That's enough. Get them off me. I feel like you're still all over me. The real pain is all through the fingers in this area. They're all latched on like the webbing between your fingers. Oh. <sighs> Dude. I'm, I'm telling you what, man. That was some of the worst, if not the worst pain that I've had the entire time. Which, by the way, I love the fact they actually give you a warning before this, like, just in case you had any thoughts around giving this a try at home. Like, like yeah, don't do that, right? And, but, but again, part of the reason I share that with you is because what these two guys would come to learn in a physical sense is something I think Paul is trying to get us to see in a spiritual sense. And that's that oftentimes worse than the bite itself is the sting. It's the sting, it's the fear of it, it's the worry of it, especially when it comes to talking about death. As again, in doing some research for this message, I, uh, I came across another study that was done that showed that the root uh, really of the majority of our phobias and fears in life is actually this fear of death. It's this fear of death. So for example, if you're a germaphobe, is it, is it that you're afraid of germs or is it that you're afraid of catching something and ultimately dying from what you caught, <laughs> right? Like, or like me, if you have arachnophobia, is it that you're really afraid of spiders or, or is it that you're afraid of getting bitten and ultimately dying? <laughs> or maybe you think your, your fears is a fear of flying, but, but is it that you're afraid of flying? Or is it that you're afraid of getting an aisle seat and then that plane going down in a ball of flames and dying, <laughs> right? Because at the root of most fears is death, is death. And, and by the way, here's the crazy thing with this, especially when it comes to, say, the fear of flying, is that often the same people who say they're afraid of flying have no problem getting in a car. Even though statistically speaking, you run a far greater chance of ultimately dying in a car crash than you ever would you know, flying in a plane. And, and yet, it's amazing how many of us will allow this fear, like to keep us from traveling to places we'll never get to see. <laughs> the trips we'll never take, new people we'll never meet, because how many know, like, you can't drive to, like, Hawaii. You can't drive to Australia. <laughs> you can't drive to, to, to so many of these places that, 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 for some of us, we'll never see because of this fear. As it's amazing how we'll let this fear of death cause us to miss out on so much of life. This fear of death to cause us to miss out on so much of life is, look, if we hope to face death and live to tell about it, the first thing we got to get if you're taking notes is that you got to realize there's some fates worse than death. There are some fates, I'm telling you, that are worse than death. In fact, we see this in Hebrews 2.15. It says, by embracing death, Jesus, taking it into himself, destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. As what's scarier than dying? Well, I, I, think, I think the Bible would tell us never really living, just, just cowering through life, not going through life the way God created you and designed you to live because you allowed the fear of death to paralyze you. 
You know, one of my favorite kind of movie lines of all time comes from a movie, A Braveheart, where Mel Gibson playing the role of, of William Wallace has been caught. He's in prison. He's getting ready to, to go to his death when, when he's kind of thrown a lifeline, a chance to, if he just renounces all the things that he's fought for, all the things he, he believed in, you know, he could get out of, you know, facing so much torture and pain of death and to which it, he kind of defiantly responds with this quote. And again, a great movie line, epic movie line of all time. He says, hey, listen, every man dies, but few ever really live. Every man dies, few ever really live. And you think, what a great line. But as good as it was when Mel Gibson said it, I kind of like Jim Elliott's version a little bit better. Now, you might not know who Jim Elliott is, but he was a Christian missionary, interesting enough, grew up uh, around Portland, and he felt this call to uh, go to the mission fields of Ecuador, and specifically to reach out to this remote uh, tribe known as the Akas, a tribe who never heard the gospel message. And so he answers this call, even realizing the risk to his life. And so he sets off on this journey with nothing but a backpack worth of supplies, a Bible, and a gun that he wasn't allowed to use except to hunt. In fact, at one point, uh, his journal would later be found, and, and in it he recounts um, a moment when things start to get heated with a conversation with some of these tribesmen. And so he's you know, like so heated, it, he gets to a point where he's, he's, he's starting to, to you know, worry about his own life, his own safety. And so he starts to kind of begin to reach for his gun in self-defense when, when suddenly he kind of thinks back to his training uh, from his missionary school days where they would train these missionaries. And in kind of the missionary training you know, guidebook or handbook that he had, it, it had in there this detail. It said, it said hey, they, were, they, they could never use a gun on someone who had yet to hear the gospel of Jesus. Which, side note, I, I think, does, does that add a detail in regards to if they've never heard the gospel? Like, is that really necessary? Like, like you know, <laughs> gun goes off. It's like, oh, it's like, Sorry. <laughs> Oh, but it's okay. It's okay. They know Jesus. They're, we already know where they're going to go. So not a, not a big deal that they got shot, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know if that detail was necessarily needed. But um, anyway, he, he eventually gets killed on this missionary trip. And in this journal of his that is left behind several days before he passes away, Jim Elliott writes down this prayer, and I, I love this prayer. It says, Father God, I, I pray not for a long life but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. A full one like you, Lord Jesus. How awesome is that? You know, when you think about it, um, Jesus, he didn't live a long time on this earth, dying on a cross at 33. In fact, how many of us would say that, that you've lived longer here on earth than Jesus did? Yeah, yeah probably, probably a lot of us, maybe, maybe even the majority of us watching this online, like billions of people in this world have lived longer here than Jesus. But in saying that, how many of you would also agree that no one has ever lived better? No one has ever lived fuller. And no one has ever accomplished more in 33 years. As look, I wonder what would happen if, if we learned to spend a little less time uh, obsessing over the length of our life and a little more time focusing on the quality of it, the, the, the weight of it, the significance of it, the fullness of it, stepping into this promise Jesus gives us in John 10.10, 10, that I have come that you may have life and have, have what? Life to the full. Life to the full. In fact, maybe the best way I can think of to sort of illustrate what is sort of meant by this is, is really this right here. Um, this kind of container full of marbles, as we'll just pretend that, and uh, with this illustration, that each of these marbles uh, really represents a moment of your life, sort of a year of your life. This is your days. Every memory, every moment represented in these marbles, right? And so there's some things in life now um, that we would say are, are in our control uh, when it comes to our time. Some things maybe not so uh, in our control. Things that that cause us to literally lose our marbles in life, right? Um, so, for example, uh, say work. It's amazing 
if you were to add up all the years you will spend of your life just working, just punching the time clock, works out to be 26 years of your life working. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of time. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, in fact, we'll add in for the really hard workers, we'll add in a couple more for overtime, right? Or, um, or how about sleeping? You'd be amazed how much time we'll spend as sleeping as, as they tell us that, you know, if you were to add up all the, the time we sleep, it adds up to being about 13 years of our life just under the covers. And again, we'll add a couple more if we're hitting the snooze button. <laughs> or how about eating? You know, you'd be amazed at how much time we'll spend just doing this. Right? <laughs> just eating. In fact, they, they, they say that works out to be about four and a half years of our life just eating. Or, or how about this one? Uh, when it comes to, uh, say, sitting around watching YouTube or Facebook or video games, sort of pick your poison. Listen, if you were to take all the hours you and I spend just looking at a screen, it works out to be 11 years of our life. That's a lot of time. Now, here's the point of this. Now, you got to understand, like, I'm, I'm not even knocking this. Like, like, this is, like, this is necessary. <laughs> like, this is what it takes, I think, for some of us just to survive, right? Like, like, you need to eat. Like, you need to sleep. You need to work. You even need to, every once in a while, just disconnect and binge watch, uh, like, tons of kings of pain, right? Like, you need that in your life. But, but think about this. Uh, up to this point, how many of us would agree you're not even really living yet? You're just surviving. You're just surviving. It's, listen, this isn't so much about getting you to question what you've already spent with your time as much as to get you to ask yourself this, is what are you going to do with the rest? What are you going to do with the rest of your time? How are you going to spend it? How are you going to live it? Because I think the temptation for most of us is, to, is really to look at what we have left and to just sort of want to hold on. To just sort of want to hold on to it, which, which ironically actually just feeds into this sting and this fear around death. You know, because when you think about fear by its very nature, it's self-absorbed. It's self-absorbed. As I love how Scripture challenges us on this in 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but catch this, perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives up fear. In fact, for, for some of us, I wonder if this hasn't been the struggle for us over the past several years. Living in fear because we became so self-protective. We forgot how to love and ultimately how to live. And leading to lives that while full of time, maybe can we admit, became empty of value. Empty of joy. Empty of purpose. Allowing fear to drive our lives rather than, the driving, rather than driving the fear out of our lives. Which can never happen, I'm telling you, as long as you're always looking inward, when you and I were created to look outward. To, to look outward, because what's the answer to the fear in our life? It's choosing to love those in and around our life. In fact, maybe no better example of this is Jesus himself. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In other words, he's our model. He's our example. For the joy set before him, it says, he endured the cross. As, as how was Jesus able to face death by, I'm telling you, by tell, living to tell others about it. Living to tell others about it. Living to tell others about God's heart for them and God's grace for them and God's mercy for them and God's God's promise for all who would uh, call on the name of Jesus, who put our hope and put our trust in him. As, listen, when it talks about the joy set before him, this is referencing so much more than, than just a place. Uh, like if the goal for Jesus was just to get to heaven, then why leave it in the first place to come here? <laughs> no, no, the joy that's being referenced here is other people. It's the joy of seeing you and seeing me with him for eternity in heaven. That, that, that was the joy. That, that, that was, that, that was the, the, the motivation, the desire of what, what even brought him to come on this rescue mission in the first place. Revealing, catch this, not just 
who he was willing to die for, but insight into what he lived for as well. As the goal for Jesus was never about extending his time here, but making the most of his time. Making the most of his time. As, as Look, I don't think it was by accident that just how often in Scripture Jesus is described as one who was full of grace and truth, a full of the Spirit, full of compassion, full of mercy, full of joy, full of forgiveness. That this full life he lived catches by not striving to hold on to his life for as long as he could, but instead choosing to freely give of his life for others, uh, serving others, caring for others, pouring into others. Not you know, seeing Jesus regularly empty his calendar to make time for the people closest in his life. You know, not wasting his life trying to hold on to grudges or, or hold on to bitterness or unforgiveness or, or getting caught up in things that at the end of the day just don't really matter in light of eternity. As listen, can I share with you some of the best time management advice I've ever gotten? And listen, I didn't get it from the Harvard Review. I got it from Scripture. Let's take a look at this. Colossians 3, 2 through 4 says, Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In other words, if it doesn't matter there, I'm not going to let it bother me here. If it doesn't matter there, I'm not going to let it bother me here. Like politics, can I tell you? If it doesn't matter there, I'm not going to waste my time getting all worked up about it here. Or that thing that somebody said about you or maybe posted about you that you've been holding on to for years. Listen, if it doesn't matter there, I'm not going to let it bother me and consume me and steal so much of my life and my time here. <laughs> because if the life and death of Jesus teaches us anything, it's that the only way you die full is to live empty. The only way you and I die full is to live empty. And so I'm going to empty my calendar to, to make time for the people in my life. I, I'm going to empty my tank and empty my time doing what I can to make a kingdom impact in this world. So, so, so maybe that's serving in kids ministry or, or getting involved in the sound team or helping serve on Easter, inviting someone to an Easter service. Like, and, and look, I know what some of you are thinking. Like, okay, that's, that's great, Pastor. You'll pour my life out, empty my life out. But, but if I do that, how does, how does that lead to dying full? Because because I don't know, but that looks pretty empty to me. <laughs> but I would argue that actually, no, 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 this is actually what's left is the stuff that matters. That this is actually full of what matters most. The things in life you can't see. Uh, things like peace and, and joy and significance and, and value and impact and fulfillment. Again, if you want to die full, you got to learn to live empty, which brings us to something else we got to get. If we hope to um, learn how to face death and, and live to tell about it. And that's that you got to understand that while death is often unexpected, it's never random. While death is often unexpected, it's never random. Now, you know, before I, I did this, this illustration um, uh, last night, I almost scrapped it because um, because it fails in one big way. And that's that you can see through the glass, right? Which, which means you can see how many marbles you have left. But in life, I mean, you know, no one knows how many marbles they have left. In life, no one really, really knows how much time you have left in this world. As, as let's be honest, uh, probably not a lot of us um, are, that are watching this are expecting to or planning on dying tomorrow. And in fact, what do most of us think? I'm good, Pastor. I got, I got a good another, you know, 20, 30, 50 years in front of me. Uh, like, I'm, I'm good. I, like I got a good doctor's report. I, I got, I'm in good health. I, I've been good with my diet. I, I've been switching my morning routine from bacon to a little more kale. Like, like I'm, I'm going to live forever. Like, I'm good. But truth is, you don't know. You, you don't know, like, like really know when it's going to happen. 
Like, like when that day is going to come when you've got to face death. Because again, death is often unexpected, but never random. As Listen, especially as believers in Jesus, there's a theological truth that I, I think sometimes we can fail to work both ways. Because if you've ever spent any time in church or grown up in church at all, you've probably heard this this kind of foundational truth from Scripture that's, that's kind of reiterated throughout its pages. And there's this concept that every person is born on purpose for a purpose. Every person is born on purpose for a purpose. Uh, Jeremiah 1.1 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I, I set you apart. Like it was no accident. Or by a random chance that you were born when you were born. Uh, like, I'm not sure how some of us tend to think of it working in heaven. Uh, like, it's a big bingo hall. And God's up there in front of the ball machine rolling around. He pulls out number 48. He's like, dude, we got 48. 48. And, and you're like, I got, that's, that's me. That's my number. I'm 48. And, and God's like, all right. You ready to go down to earth and tear it up? Like, this is your time to be born. Like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. No. No, you were, God made you, God shaped you for this moment, uh, for this time in history, for such a time as this. Like there's times where uh, I find myself watching an old Western movie or catch Holly watching something like Wind Calls the Heart, and, and it can seem so romantic. But when I really think about it, I've come to realize that there's a reason why I was born in the day and age of electricity and indoor plumbing and Starbucks. Because God knew I wouldn't have lasted real long in the late 1800s. As I'm, I'm pretty sure when God determined to bring me into this world for such a time as this, he was like, I'm going to use, I'm going to use you. But I can already tell you're going to need some help. <laughs> you're going to need some running water. You're going to need things like a, a Keurig. You're, you're going to need things like a microwave. You're going to need someone like Holly in your life. Or, or you're not going to make it very long, because God knew me, God formed me, God designed me, he he created me specifically for this moment in time, and the same holds true for you. Again, you were born on purpose for a purpose. Uh, Like, I don't care what your, your mom might have said, look, you are no mistake, you are no accident, you were placed in this world for such a time as this. For such a time as this. And, and yet here's the thing. Here's why I say we don't always tend to work it both ways. Is, is if we believe that we were brought in here at the right time and at the right place, why do we not also believe that when he chooses to take us out, that it's also at the right time and the right place? That if there was purpose in my birth and and purpose in my life, there's equally purpose in my death. In other words, it's not just random. It doesn't just happen by chance. That the same God who brought me into this world is the same God who has the final say of when I get taken out of it. Uh, Job 121 says it this way. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, my life and and even my death is ultimately in his hands. It's ultimately in his hands, which, which at first might not sound like very good news, until you realize that if it's in his hands, you know what that means? It's not in the hands of a tyrant. It's not in the hands of some crazy person. It's not in the hands of COVID. It's not in the hands of cancer. It's not in the hands of that that negative doctor's report that you just got. Check this out. In Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, Jesus speaks into this a little bit more. He says, Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Now, admittedly, that, that might sound a little extreme. It's like, uh, Pastor, I thought this was supposed to be encouraging. Well, well stick with it, because you got to keep reading. Because what it does is it starts to reveal God's heart in this. Uh, let's take a look. Verse 6, as it continues on, it says, oh, What is the price of five sparrows, two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. 
and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Again, what's Jesus trying to get across to us? It's his heart. It's his care. It's his concern for us by, by reminding us that we serve a God who, I'm telling you, loves us too much to just leave our life and even our death to chance. Now, now in saying that, though, I, I, can, I can already imagine some of the questions kind of going through your mind. Some of the same questions that go through my mind when, when I, I thought on this and, and was preparing this. Is, and as this is, is one of the things you've got to understand, I really want to be clear on this is don't mistake the fact that our death is in his hands as being on his hands. Don't mistake the fact that our death is in his hands as being on his hands, like like he's not the cause of it. As the Bible's pretty clear that that, that death isn't the result of a vengeful God, but the result of a broken, fallen, sinful world. No, no, when I say death is, is in his hands, what I'm trying to get us to see is that means that it's never out of his hands. It's never out of his hands. That God and God alone has the final say when it comes to death. As the truth is, you don't go unless God says so. Do you realize that? You don't go unless God says so. And this is why I say this encourages me so much and should encourage you as well. As look, you can trust that God won't say it's time to go until your time is done. This is why the first words that if you're a follower of Christ that the Bible says you can expect to hear when you step into heaven is not, well, hey, at least you tried. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, you, you gave it your best shot. No, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. In other words, mission accomplished, job complete, job well done. Be- because the promise is that that you're not done when you die, you die when God's done. As look, I'm just telling some of you, and I think some of you need to hear this, you might die with unfulfilled dreams, but you never have to worry about dying with unfulfilled purpose. Because again, your time's not done until you've done everything he's created you to do. Which on the flip side of that also means this, that there's a point to our death that also means there's a point to our life. That if you've got, still got a, a pulse, you can trust that you still got a purpose. That if you're still breathing, then God's still a blessing. If, if you're still walking, then God's still a working. If you're still praying, God's still moving. Come on. Like, I don't care if you're 80. I don't care if you're 95 years old, 100 years old. Watch this. I don't care if you're watching this from hospice and you've got a few days left to live. Listen, if you still got breath in your lungs, you still got a job to do. And God has still called some, put some people on your heart and people into your life to pray for, to, to encourage, to speak blessing over, and maybe to invite and share God's work in and through your life, into their life. Listen, if you got a pulse, you got a purpose, that there is a reason for why you're still here. You got a job to do. And I'm telling you, that job is is bigger than just being about you. Listen, as long as you're down here, that means you still got a job to do before you get up there. Which brings us to something else. If you hope to face death and and really live to tell about it, and and wrap up with this, is that, that, listen, you, you overcome death by embracing life. It takes understanding that the way you and I overcome death is really by embracing Life, real, true life. The kind of life that's only found in this relationship with Jesus Christ. As check this out again, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Again, Jesus, by embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death. He destroyed the devil's hold on death. Now, now notice it doesn't say he, he destroyed death altogether in that moment. That doesn't happen until the return of Christ, but he destroyed the devil's hold on it. That, that fear around it, the anxiety around it, the worry around it, and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. In other words, Jesus took on death so we can truly take hold of life. And not just life abundant, life to the full, but life eternal. And in fact, this is where faith 
really I find tends to diverge from society and science. Because while I'm so thankful for some of the scientific and medical breakthroughs in our world, they're giving us things like vitamins and, and medicines and vaccines and coffee. Come on, somebody. <laughs> things that can extend our days, extend our, our years, extend our life, even delay death. But here's the thing, while society tries to deny death, science works to delay death. I mean, you know, only faith in Jesus can truly defy death. Defy death, because while the world says that life ends when a pulse is absent, faith says death ends because a tomb was empty. Where, where by faith, Jesus facing death and living to tell others about it through his death and his resurrection reminds us as followers of Christ, look, we don't have to live our life running in fear of death because we know what's on the other side of it. We know what's on the other side of it. In fact, I wonder if this is why Paul was able to say what he was able to say, walk with such confidence as is expressed in Philippians 1.21, where he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, because he understood something we gotta get. And that's that what oftentimes we refer to and we call death here, heaven calls birth. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but this place, this is, this is not your home, at least your real home. You know, in fact, Jesus spoke of it saying uh, when, when he died on the cross and ultimately arose again and, and ascended in heaven, he said, hey, listen, I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you, you your real home. And in fact, at other places in scripture, it describes us as foreigners in this place. Um, and it's in that place. And, where we're at home, listen, our real home. How I many you know when you're at home, like, like you can really finally be you, right? Like, like you don't have to try to pretend to be something else. Like you can truly kick off your shoes, throw on your sweatpants. Like, like you don't care what people say or how people see you. Like you can really be you. And so when it's talking about the, this real home in heaven, it's also the place where we step into real life true life. And in other words, as believers in Jesus, we can walk with this freedom and this confidence of knowing that, that when my eyes shut for the, the last time here on this earth, it's the very same moment that my eyes open up for the first time to see the wonder and the beauty and the comfort of my real home and my real life, this life that's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. A life to the full, life abundant, and life eternal. Look, look, if you're watching this, and, and again, death is, has got a grip on you. Maybe you're watching that stuff on the news, or maybe after years of dealing with, with COVID and all the, you know, maybe, maybe you've lost some people really close around you. Maybe you got a really negative doctor's report not too long ago. Uh, listen, Listen, while you can't always stop death from happening, that doesn't mean you gotta let death stop you from living. That, that there's a life, there's a, there's a life that you can walk with confidence and with hope and with faith and with joy that I'm telling you is found only in this relationship with Jesus. And so listen, if, if you wanna experience that, experience this peace and this life and this freedom that's found in him, I invite you to, to pray this prayer with me. Pray this prayer with me, and, and, and in doing so, break free from that grip of death in your life, the, the, this grip of death that you weren't created to just live in, but you were created to live in freedom and live with hope and live with confidence and live with faith. And listen, if that's you, I encourage you to take this step to pray this prayer with me in your heart. Father God, I, I, I'm, I'm tired of, of running in fear of, of death. I'm tired of, of running in, in, in fear and living less than the life I was created to live by just trying to hold on to this life for as long as I can. But God, I, I recognize that there's a life that I was created for, my, my real life, my true life, the kind of life that's found only in this relationship with you that I want to take hold of today. I want to take hold of today. As, as Jesus, I, I recognize that, that I've made more than a few mistakes. I've slipped up more than a few times. But I believe you love me enough 
to leave heaven to come to earth on this rescue mission, to die on a cross for me, for all my sin and all of my shame, past, present, future, not not just for the sin of the world, but but my sin. That as I ask you to come into my life, as I choose to make you Lord and Savior of my life, that that baggage, that that weight, that burden of fear that maybe I brought into this, this time together watching this message, I realized that I don't have to take another step into my life and into my week and into my days holding on to that fear anymore. But I'm taking hold of this life abundant and life eternal, the kind of life that's found only in this relationship with you, Jesus, right now. As Jesus, I ask you to come into my life to be Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, we'd love to be able to send you a few more resources to kind of help you in those first steps Um, Maybe some of those second steps is maybe it was a recommitment for you and trying to get right back on track with this walk with Christ. Again, we would love to be able to send you some resources. And so uh, I encourage you, uh, maybe just message us in the chat box uh, there and we'll make sure we get some of those resources to you. Or you can go to the websites, uh, walport4.org or newport4.org and uh, shoot us a a message and we'll make sure that we get you a good Bible and some resources to kind of help you with those, those first steps in this new journey, this life, this exciting, adventurous, abundant life that's found in Jesus Christ. So hey, with that, again, thank you for tuning in. I love you guys. God bless. Look forward to seeing you this Easter as we celebrate the ultimate death-defying event in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm-hmm.